Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, can I have your attention, please? We're about to get started. Ladies and gentlemen, special guests, all, good morning. Now, wait, now, you can do better than that. Now, this is a bright Monday. It's about 40 degrees outside. You're sitting in the Pentagon Auditorium on this blessed day. Let's try that again. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you all for being here today to help us honor and celebrate National African American History Month. But before we get the program started, I ask that you please silence your phones. And also, since this event is being recorded, I ask that you hide or remove your badges. Thank you so much. It is a pleasure for me to be here with you today representing the Honorable Chuck Hagel, our Secretary of Defense, and the Honorable Jessica Wright, the Acting Under Secretary of Defense for Personnel and Readiness. On their behalf, I am pleased to extend a warm welcome to all of you at this DOD History Speaker event to observe 2014 National African American History Month. This year's theme for this observance period is civil rights in America. It honors the valuable contributions and the important legacy of people of African descent. This was indeed landmark legislation that I will submit to you put our nation closer toward a more perfect union as the preamble to our Constitution relates. Civil rights in America has enabled our great nation to fully realize and fully capitalize on the human capital potential that resides in this great tapestry called America. Secretary Hegel put it best, I think, at a speech he gave last month when he said that diversity is a key to our strength in the department, indeed a key to the strength of our nation. Think about it, over the last 50 years, how much the nation has benefited from the contributions of women, of minorities, of persons with disabilities, of LGBT individuals, and certainly our department has benefited. See, there are those that predicted that by now, your nation's armed volunteer force would have eroded. We've been at war for over a decade, but I'm happy to report that the all-volunteer force remains strong. I will submit to you that a high-quality force makes us strong. I would further submit that a high-quality, diverse force makes us stronger. And throughout the history of the United States, our diverse nation has benefited certainly from the service of African Americans. These great pioneers have played a myriad of critical roles in the making of our country and the sustainment of our mission. In fact, African Americans have participated in every war that our country has faced, beginning with the Revolutionary War where Crispus Attucks is widely considered as the first, the first casualty of the American Revolutionary War. And since then, African Americans have demonstrated their bravery and steadfast commitment to the nation and continue to shape America. We are immensely inspired by, by and pay great homage to their countless sacrifices made and burdens carried to uphold the promise of freedom, equality, justice for all citizens and future generations. The Civil Rights in America theme reminds us that while we have made great progress, there is still work to be done. Even 50 years later, the Civil Rights Act continues to resonate today. It is important for us all to take a stand to promote 
diversity and inclusiveness. It is one of the reasons why we are here today. Now our office, the Office of Diversity Management and Equal Opportunity, I am happy to serve as the director in that office. We continue to work with the services to lead the nation in building and maintaining a diverse, integrated workforce. We recognize, of course, that diversity goes well beyond race and gender because we rely on the diverse backgrounds, perspectives, and expertise of all of our people to successfully respond to the many complex challenges of the 21st century na national security landscape. DOD is committed to removing barriers that prevent service members and civilians from rising to their highest potential. I am proud to say that African Americans make tremendous contributions in roles critical to national defense, making right now up to 16 percent of our military workforce and just about 15 percent of our DOD civilian workforce. And of course, we continue to work to recruit and develop a total force that's reflective of the nation that we serve. It is my honor today to also introduce to you our guest speaker for today. He is Dr. Isaac Hampton II. Dr. Hampton is the command historian at U.S. Army South, San Antonio, Texas, where he provides historical support to the U.S. Army activities in the Caribbean and Latin America. He is also an accomplished scholar and lecturer. In 2013, he published the Black Officer Corps, a history of black military advancement from integration through Vietnam. President Barack Obama's proclamation of 2014 National African American History Month stated, and I quote, every American can draw strength from the story of hard-won progress, which not only defines the African American experience, but it also lies at the heart of our nation as a whole, end of quote. Now, through Dr. Hampton's research and publications, he provides a very truthful and humanistic account of what it is like to be an African American serving our country and details the hard won progress that African Americans achieved. The accomplishments of African Americans during the Vietnam era specifically had a profound impact on future generations of black officers. And by hearing the personal stories that Dr. Hampton captured, we can all gain a better understanding of the struggle for and the importance of civil rights. With that said, I'm excited and honored to welcome Dr. Isaac Hampton to the podium. Sir. Okay, good morning. Again, thank you all for uh, coming today. Uh, this is a great moment for me to be with so many outstanding people in such a remarkable place as I was explaining uh, to uh, Thomas Christensen, Christensen uh, this is kind of like the Super Bowl for me, okay, to be speaking in a place such as the Pentagon. I remember as a kid, I thought this place was always cool. Uh, I want to generously thank uh, Mr. Johnson and the Office of Diversity Management and Equal Opportunity and the OSD Office for inviting me to be a guest speaker as part of the Department of Defense uh, History Speaker Series. Again, thank you very much, okay. Now, before I, I get into the talk, I want to give uh, kind of a, a public service announcement uh, about some of the things that I'm going to be talking about today. And because much of this uh, has to deal with race, it can make people uncomfortable. Uh, we'll see that, just let me explain, we're not talking about anybody here, we're not talking about anyone's family here, this happened uh, a long time ago, but the conversation is still relevant. Let me contextualize the period that, that brings us to this topic. We'll see that in the 1950s and through the Vietnam era, America was ingesting uh, some, some very, very challenging uh, racial changes. First, we have the beginning of the modern civil rights movement. We see the era of school desegregation. We have the Montgomery bus boycott, church bombings across the South, an unpopular war in Vietnam, which would lead to a disproportionate number of African American deaths. We have race riots in Watts, in Detroit, in on military bases, such as Travis Air Force Base. And of course, we have the Black Power Movement. And happening at the same time, by the time we get to the late 60s and early 70s, we have rampant drug use in the military. 
So again, uh, this whole period uh, was arguably the most troublesome time in American history since the Civil War and since Reconstruction. Now the area that I'm talking about, which is the military, we'll see that it was looking for solutions to these problems and what was happening to a period of civil unrest within its ranks. But again, this also was happening not only in the United States, but also in Germany, on Navy ships, and of course, in the jungles of Vietnam. So during the next approximately 40 minutes, I will examine the condition of the black officer and the forces that surrounded them prior to, during, and just after the Vietnam era. So I, I want to start with a quote. One click, please. I'll read this. I wish I could say that racism and prejudice were only distant memories. We must dissent from the indifference. We must dissent from the apathy. We must dissent from the fear, the hatred, and the mistrust. We must dissent because America can do better, because America has no choice but to do better. Anyone know who said that? Yeah. One click. Yeah. Thurgood Marshall. Okay. And I start that quote because in many ways, while this is out of the timeline by, you know, nearly 30 years, uh, we see that during the Vietnam era that blacks and white Americans in and out of uniform were calling for this, this type of, these types of change that we see happening, okay? Next slide. Now, there's been a significant amount of literature written in the United States concerning the Vietnam era. However, very little has been done on the experience of African-American military officers concerning this period. The history of African-Americans in the United States military has predominantly been written from a top-down perspective. On the subject of black officers, official military history has failed to capture their unique personal challenges in the midst of the civil rights and black power movements of the 1960s. Now, we see that much of the traditional press and official histories that would, that would look at African-American officers uh, was, it was kind of like an, an, insular, an insular look that did not really address the unique challenges that black officers would have as a race in uniform. And during the 1960s, we see that the race would be experiencing a new cultural awakening and would be disillusioned by the broken promises of President Lyndon B. Johnson's great society and the remaining influences of the South still held on racial politics. So the, let me say that when we, when we look at the literature, most of it has been written about the enlisted side of African Americans who served in the Vietnam era, and rightly so. There are going to be the larger numbers. But as I began to research some of this, what I found was a hole in the literature that left out this segment of, of men who, who, who went through very challenging times. But on top of that, it's almost as if the institution um, almost had them as just really not having any political opinion or even talking about the challenges that they had went through as leaders in uniform. And again, uh, this ties into the whole civil rights question. Next slide. We see the rhetorical message of the 1960s from men such as Malcolm X, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Ron Karanga, Bobby Seale, and Stokely Carmichael was a combination of racial confluence, black solidarity, cultural awareness, and civil rights advancement for African Americans. However, their message rarely supported an African American's decision for a military career and reminded black officers that the United States had never been fair to its citizens of color. So again, the question remains, how could black officers, how could they serve a nation that did not allow them to enjoy all of the civil and social rights, political rights of American citizenship, okay? And those words, uh, I mean, just think about it for a moment. You know, they couldn't stay in certain motels, okay? They couldn't eat at certain diners when women would go into certain stores to put a hat on to see if it fit, someone would come running out and say, uh, 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 don't, don't put that hat on, okay? So I'm saying that these are some of the challenges that they would have to go through while they're in service of the country, they, they and their families. So again, let me get to the question, that, to answer those questions based on the research of what I found. And number one, 
most served out of a sense of patriotism for their country. Number two, others served because military service fulfilled a sense of adventure. Again, these were young men, uh, and we see that they would come from the rural areas of the country. Some would come from the ghettos, the streets of New York. And again, this gets them out of their environment where they can see the world. Number three, the 1950s and 60s uh, for African Americans. Economically, this was one of the best places blacks could go who completed a college degree was to enter the US military. And number four, which is a little more complex, we see that based on the historical cultural mandate that dates back as far as the Revolutionary War, in the sense that when African Americans took on the role of soldiers to join white citizens in a common national struggle, blacks were provided an agency not only to prove their pride and proudness on the battlefield, but also to secure their place in the country and gain rights. In the words of W.E.B. Du Bois, military service was the surest instrument for advancement. So folks, saying all that, it's just simply about citizenship. African Americans want all the rights of citizenship that the 14th Amendment guaranteed them. Okay, so these are, these are some of the things uh, that we see. Now, beyond opportunities for social and political advancement, one of the key areas history has neglected in depth is the examination and professional advancement and development of the Black Officer Corps from the 1950s to the Vietnam era. Since 1881, a form of written evaluation has been used to rate officers in America's military. Prior to this, the U.S. Army was rel relatively small, and most officers stayed with their same regiments for most of their careers there was no need for a formal assessment system. Officers' careers were advanced by a combination of service reputation, patronage, and nepotism during this informal period of officer evaluations. Now, when we look at OERs, officer efficiency reports, we really don't see the modern OER come into being until 1947 with the Officer Personnel Act under the Truman Administration. Now, for African-American officers, we'll see that their efficiency reports would make a mockery of the system uh, once we get to the 1950s and through the Vietnam era because as a group, they were rated below white officers uh, for the following reasons. Number one, in the 1950s and 60s, many staff officers, staff officers in the Army held the same ideas about blacks in uniform as they did in the 1930s and 40s. Number two, white officers who were segregationists did not believe black officers should hold leadership positions outside of combat roles and commanding their race. And number three, some white officers in influential positions felt blacks should not have the honor of having combat arms occupations and leading soldiers into battle. Tip of the spear leadership roles was to be reserved for white officers because this challenged the natural order of American society and invaded what we call in historical studies as white space. Number four, there was a deep-seated belief among many white officers that HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities, were not providing education at the same level as traditional universities. And again, this we will see uh, as I get into my presentation that this would handicap uh, black officers uh, critically. And number five, we'll see that most black officers would hold uh, reserve commissions, okay? Now, let me jump back to number one quickly. Uh, as far as by the time we get to the 50s and 60s, that many young officers would hold the same ideas, uh, white officers would hold the same ideas about blacks that those in the 30s and 40s did. We see that there'd be a lot of impressionable young officers, okay? And many of these men, not all, not all, because they're good ones as well, uh, we see that basically uh, the same ideas that they have about blacks, this, this is passed on. And by the time we get to the evaluation section, uh, they tend to follow the same train of thinking that their mentors did, okay? And this is what happens as young people. Sometimes we pick up bad habits, okay? Now, that being said, this leads to the findings of unfair promotion of black officers, which leads us to the Butler Report, written in 1971 by Colonel Douthard Butler. This report consisted of 286 charts and graphs and statistics that came from the inquiry and report generator system and management information system. Next slide. Uh, and of course, I got ahead of myself, group, uh, when we begin to talk about inequities at home. But again, this is the backdrop of what African Americans were going through as far as the whole civil rights question. Okay. All right. Next slide. 
Okay. And there he is, uh, Colonel Douthard Butner. I will speak of him in the past tense, but he is actually with us today. Okay. Now, let me give you a little bit of background uh, for the study. We see that the, that the collected data uh, looked at officers who were in the Army from 31 December 1956 through 31 December 1972. This report was a comprehensive statistical analysis of a selected segment of the Army's officer evaluation rating system. The findings of the report revealed startling disparities in the ratings given to white and black officers of three separate cohorts of officer efficiency reports that tracked officers' ratings and promotions. These incorrect ratings resulted in a devastating impact of black officer promotions, career-enhancing assignments, accession into the regular Army, selection for advanced military schooling, and ultimately underrepresentation in the leadership of the Army Officer Corps. So on the surface, OERs would have an outwardly neutral appearance, as any evaluation system should have. However, while the promotion system was fair in form, it was discriminatory in operation because of the adverse impact on African Americans. With the Butler Report, we see various patterns of exclusion concerning black officers. Okay? And let me say that this is most of the report, but a little more background about Butler. Uh, he's from Waxahachie, Texas. Uh, not so far from Dallas, but he was a 1955 graduate from, Pr from Prairie View, a mathematician, a pilot of fixed wings and rotary aircraft. Uh, also served with Hal Moore. Uh, his battalion was in the Battle of Idrang. So again, he comes with some pretty heavy credentials. And over the, the hardest part of working on this, this study for me, and let me, th this is kind of like the Rosetta Stone of trying to understand uh, how officer promotions and ratings can be, can be biased. And with the Butler Report, look, it took me the better part of around three years while I was doing my dissertation work to get my head around these, these numbers. Uh, like I said, Butler is a mathematician, but let me share something with you. Um, I'm going to expose myself, not physically, all right, <laughs> but uh, intellectually. Look, the reason why I did not pursue advanced degrees in science, math, and physics was because there's so much math, all right? So that being said, uh, when we look at statistical analysis as historians, the, the numbers have, don't have nearly the impact that they should unless we have the voices that live this experience. And I carried out uh, probably close to 200 oral history interviews. Not all of the excerpts make it into the book, but these experiences they talk about the impact of how, what these numbers had on their careers, how they were rated, okay? So again, this is probably the most important section because the number is just, we have to go beyond that. And for, do I have any GS employees here? Raise your hands. Look, when I talk about the pain of living through an experience, when I say NSPS, does that mean anything? Okay, so again, these are some of the things uh, that we actually see. Now, since excellence knows no color, the disproportionate point difference between black and white officers' efficiency ratings tracked over a 15-year period would suggest that black merit, more often than not, was ignored based on the prejudicial tendencies of the day. All right, and I want to get into a little bit of sli slideology, so just stay with me. Next time, slide. Okay, and what, what we see here, look, this is a recreation of, of the Butler report, some of the, uh, some of the slides, okay? So I was able to actually use some, some, some modern graphics and put these together. But look, in OER, let me just explain for those who are here, it's, it's basically your grade, your grade card, your rating for what officers would get. And we have, I have OER 67-4 and OER 67-6. OER the reason why five is left out so we can see the gap, okay? So OER 67-4 would track officers' career from 1956 to 19. Uh, 61. And the blue stands for African American officers, and the red stands for white officers. Here, the higher the number, okay, the better your score is, all right? And we see here these, the arrows, this is where uh, blacks and whites are peeking out. We'll see that here, the one, 101 to 110, the arrow, this is where African Americans are peeking out, right here. When we get to white officers, it's almost like they have a double plateau here at, 11, at, at the, the 111 to 120 and the 121 to 130, okay? And at this point, we see black officers going down while white officers are still peaking, okay? Now, just, just stick with me. 
The next chart jumps ahead, basically, uh, as far as 1971. We see that the number of ratings have, have changed, okay? But this is a distinction without difference. Here we see that blacks would peak out right around two, 210 to 220. Whites would peak out here 10 points ahead. And while blacks are falling, we see that whites are still gaining. Long and short, folks, is that African-American officers were rated 10 to 15 points behind white officers. And this was devastating to their careers, okay? And I'll, I'll get to the, the reasons why um, in a moment. But as far as the origins of the study, when, when Butler was lieutenant colonel, he was, he was about to get his um, battalion. He's up for a battalion. He's working at the Pentagon, okay? He just come back from Vietnam. And this is gonna be right around early 1971. And what we see happening is that uh, his boss, Colonel John Marr, uh, sends him over to go check on, go to the, uh, to the S-1 to see what's going to happen with your battalion. When he gets there, he is told that, no, you're, you're not eligible, you're not going to receive a battalion. And his question was, well, why not? And they said, well, you have a weak early file. And his response is, well, what in the hell does that mean? Well, during this time, the Army went to what was known as the total man concept the total man concept. And what this did was that it looked at an officer's career from lieutenant all the way until the time that they come up for uh, these field grade ranks. And based on these earlier reports that were extremely low for African Americans, this would prevent them from getting their command, okay? So it's almost like uh, the tail wagging the dog where these early reports uh, hurt black officers, okay? So uh, with the whole idea of having a weak early file, uh, we'll see that this plagued black officers through and through. So I'll, I'll get into that in just, a, in just a moment. Okay, next slide. And again, this is uh, another one I have up where you can see the same thing uh, for lieutenant colonels. Okay, and here we see that African Americans peak out right around 33. And here we see another double plateau for white officers. Okay, they're up around here. And again, by the time we get 15, nearly 15 years later, uh, we see that here again, uh, black officers are peaking out right under the 210 to 220. White officers are still 10 points ahead. Now, again, I'll explain that in just a moment. But let me uh, read a quote from you um, from one of my oral history interviews. And one of the things is that officers really had no idea how these OERs worked and how they would impact their careers. And this is a quote from a Colonel Clarence Miller, a uh, retired Fulberg. And I quote, I think they took advantage of officers on the efficiency reports because many black officers did not have someone to tell them what these scores really meant. Many of us who thought we were getting good scores didn't know that we were being damned with faint praise. And the other component that goes along with these OERs is going to be the written narrative. And with the written narrative, uh, this was kind of, you know, it, it would just talk about the officer's ability, their advance, how they commanded. And for African-American officers, some of the comments, and obviously I couldn't actually see the OERs, uh, but some of the comments that would come back were black officers were rated, you see a quote like this, Captain uh, Lionel Jackson uh, is a good looking athletic black officer. Okay. Colonel Lionel Jackson is always out front during PT and he also uh, is, has a sharp looking uniform. Let me ask, what does that say about their ability to have for leadership? Does that say anything at all? Now, there'd be other OERs. Uh, one that I was able to get hold of, it said, I don't know what color this gentleman was, but it would say, uh, Major Jack Johnson is a competent officer when not drunk. <laughs> okay, so uh, these, are, these are some of the things that, that we see. Now, one other point, um, Major General Julius Parker, uh, retired two-star MI. Some of you may know him. In 1956, uh, he goes over to Korea, has an excellent rifle company. And when he gets back to Washington, D.C., uh, he goes to, he wants to go and look at his record. Now, while in Korea, uh, his company is so outstanding, uh, the commanding general uh, of his group says, Julius, you've done a fine job take the helicopter back to base. You don't have to worry about this dust on all the roads. So he knows he's going to get a great OER. When he looks at his record, and I quote uh, General Parker, 
he says, the only thing remotely positive I found in my OER was this intelligent young black officer needs high levels of supervision. And Parker said, man, what am I still doing in the Army? Okay, so it's things like this uh, that black officers had to contend with with their ratings. Okay, so these are some of the things that we see. Um, I want to read one more comment about Miller and his early experience uh, with OERs. And I quote Colonel Miller, he's a lieutenant then. Miller believed that receiving fours was an average rating because the rating form stated average. He asked his commanders, his, his commander, is that what you think of me? His commander replied, that score is very good for lieutenant. Clarence, I as a captain get fives, majors get sixes, lieutenant colonels get seven. So a four for lieutenant, this is good, this is great for you. Miller replied to me, he says this, during this time, I was stupid enough to believe that. And let me ask, is, is average ever good enough in anything? Is it? No, it isn't. For black officers, we know this is true. I mean, for any officer, black or white. Now, the other thing that we see, uh, can you go back one slide, please? Is that one of the arguments was that, oh, wow, you know, you black officers are doing good. You're right here in the middle of the pack. This is where you're supposed to be, okay, in, in both of these charts, okay? They're right here just at the cusp, okay? But let me say this. All the actions up here, these are the folks who are getting promoted right in this area, okay? So I'm saying blacks are on the outside looking in. Okay, next slide. And next slide. Now this leads to the Vietnam argument, a very popular argument, okay? So the argument that Vietnam greatly helped the status and ascension, uh, and ascension of black officers is, is misleading and not entirely true. Now, strange enough, we see that between 1969 and 1972, there'd be a 30% increase in the number of African-American majors, which gave some merit to this argument. However, there were multiple factors behind uh, these forces that would push black officers ahead. And one of them is going to be the creation of the Congressional Black Caucus. All right. They bring pressure on the administration, on the Johnson administration, on the Nixon administration, as far as what's being done for black officers, or just blacks in general, the military. Number two would be Secretary of Defense and Melvin Laird's 1969 Domestic Action Council that spearheaded the development of, race, of a racial relations program in the military. And number three, the Army established an official affirmative action program in 1972. Okay, so all these forces are behind. It's more than Vietnam. But when Butler was briefing his report, and the report uh, was briefed as high as the Secretary of the Army, one of the arguments was, well, listen, look, Vietnam has helped black officers. It's given them more exposure, and it did. Okay, it exposed them to combat, that's for sure. But the argument was, look, things are much better for you. And when we take the, when the promotion curves are taken from OER 67-4 and OER 67-6, as far as promotion trends, they are synonymous. They're exactly the same. So what I'm saying is that between 1956 and 1972, black officers were still rated 10 to 15 points behind white officers. So basically the system has not changed for them. Okay, so you see there's some of the things uh, that we actually see. Now, what we see happening is, we see a new term that's, that's going to be created and thrown around. We have moved beyond the Bull Connor, Johnny Reb overt racism. What we see happening now is systemic or institutional uh, racism. Okay, so next slide. And this leads us to regular army versus other than regular army. Now, let me explain. A, a regular army commission, when you first enter the, uh, the army, again, my, my work is army centric, let me say that is that the only people who enter with regular Army Commission are those who graduate from West Point, okay? Now, the other uh, way, obviously, through ROTC, uh, this would be other than regular Army, you, re you have a Reserve Commission. Unless you're a distinguished military graduate, these are going to be the only ones who are going to have a regular Army uh, Commission, okay? So, uh, we see that for, for African Americans uh, and whites during this time is that statistically, uh, they're going to be on this lower end here. All right, now by the time, the reason why I have major highlighted is because this is going to be the turning point uh, for an officer's career. And we see that for the fact that blacks, look at this point, 
they're still not being ported over uh, to these regular Army uh, commissions. And this would have an effect on the assignments that they get. It will have an effect on promotion. When, when promotion packets come up, uh, we'll see that for a regular Army, this person is seen as a lifer, okay, as a person that is in it to win it. Other than regular Army are kind of seen uh, as not being committed to the not not being committed to the institution, and let me read a quote from you, and this is come, this also comes from uh, Major General Julius Parker. This is what he says. Parker received a two when he received a two block rating instead of a one block. Uh, he would he asked his commander, you know, why why didn't he receive a one block? And the commander replied, Jay, what are you worried about? Your reserve officer, your Christmas help. You don't need a good evaluation. Regular Army guys need high valuations. So again, we see that even here, we see that higher OER ratings are, uh, that we see is, is not going to be promoted, given uh, to a lot of black officers. And again, this isn't across the board, but we see that uh, more often than not, these are some of the things that we happen. And the other thing, this will lead to the atrophy of African-American officers. Okay, next slide. Now, I want to talk about HBCUs uh, for just one moment. One more, one more clip. Okay. Now, keep in mind that for African-American officers, nearly 80% will come from HBCUs. And uh, there's, again, as I mentioned, there's going to be a built-in bias against African-Americans who come from these institutions. And look, it's largely based on the fact that during the 60s and 50s, uh, there would be an unfamiliarity with HBCUs. So when you have a promotion packet that would come across from a guy, let's say, from Ohio State, and one from Prairie View, one from Southern, one from Florida A&M, and remember there are only 14 HBCUs with, with ROTC programs, not 14 in total, but we see that there's an unfamiliarity and the fact that they believe, implicit bias or not, that these institutions were not creating good officers. Okay, so again, this works against blacks. And then here, Look at the numbers here. Between 1971 and 73, approximately 36 blacks were commissioned at West Point compared to nearly, you know, over 2,400 uh, white Americans. All right, so again, this will have other impacts on them as they ascend into the rank when we get into the 70s. Now, this leads to African Americans having to be ultra competitive. And I want to read a quote from Colonel Joe Alton. He was asked, uh, by an assistant division commander is why African-American officers are so damned competitive. I mean, it's almost a, a frictionless uh, area. And this is what Al Alton's reply was. Sir, the system makes us competitive. We have to be twice as good to get half the recognition. The system weeds us out early, and the few that get through the sieve know that they have to be very good. We can't depend on subjective judgment when you sit down and write an OER. We've got to give you things to think about that are objective, things you can see, feel, and count. And that's why we want to focus on things that are quantifiable. Hopefully, that will override any subjective opinion that you have about us when you look at our OERs, when you look at what the soldier has done, when you look at how the soldier has performed, and when you look at his readiness. Okay, so again, this is the type of environment that African American officers have to actually go through. Now, tying this in to a decline in black officers, look, with the up and out system with, with the reserve commissions, look, we'll see that blacks will become frustrated, they will be put out of the service, and whites too, as the force draws down, but I'm saying this has a much greater impact on African Americans because of their small numbers. Let me give you some statistics. We'll see that the white officer corps was approximately 91,000 at the end of the Second World War. Blacks were, uh, held less than 1% of the officer commissions at the end of the Second World War. In June of 1945, there were 41 African-American officers with regular Army commissions. I said regular Army, not in total. At the beginning of the Korean War, there would be 1,317 in uniform. And in 1972, there were 4,700 black officers out of an approximately 110,000 Army officer corps. With projected atrophy of officers of color from 1973 to 1977 at approximately 360 per year or 1,800 over a three-year period, this would shrink the black officer's strength to approximately 2,900. 
well on the road to World War II and Korean War black officer numbers of right around 1600. So again, we see the atrophy of the Black Officer Corps happening uh, right around the volunteer, uh, the Volar Force, okay? So again, we see that black officers are in trouble. Next slide. All right. Shifting gears, again, when you, during the interviews with the African-American officers, um, I also uh, was very fortunate to speak with their wives. And to a man, to every successful officers, uh, they never said they had a good woman behind them. They said they had a great woman beside them. And these women were critical in helping African-American officers, and I would submit to all officers, black and white, to have successful military careers. But we see that uh, there would be certain guidelines that these women would need to follow. And uh, we see that Shia's book uh, was actually given uh, as a gift to many wives, uh, black and white. It's kind of the first how-to book of how to be a good military wife. And we'll see that the ma army was, was masterful in reminding uh, these women that a distracted husband was a dead husband. Okay, so the idea is for them to focus. Now, let me go to the next slide. All right, and this is going to be the four basic responsibilities of how uh, army wives of all colors have to support or should have supported their husbands. And number one, to make a congenial home. Okay, this is, this is one thing they definitely have to do. Number two, to rear a family which her husband could be proud of. Number three, to strengthen her husband's morale and the quantum physics behind all of this, what makes all this work, next click, the collective science of good housekeeping. It's a good thing this is not February 14th. We might have some people in trouble, right? <laughs> so a, a, again, we see that the idea uh, for these women is to make a congenial home uh, for these men in uniform. Now, one of the reasons why the armed forces con consistently projected ideas of patriotic duty on military wives was so they would view separations and overseas duty stations where their entire family would accompany their soldiers as adventures or challenges and not troublesome pitfalls of being married to a military person. So like today's military uh, spouses, we see that women of both races uh, would have to double as father, they'd have to double as bus driver, fixing things around the home. And, and what I'm getting at, this is before family readiness groups. So again, uh, we see that this is a tough job that women would have to actually uh, deal with as far as uh, supporting these men in uniform. However, next slide, African-American women uh, who are the wives of these officers uh, have other challenges. And while on the surface, uh, their journey may seem unremarkable, in the context of the civil rights movement, uh, we'll see that these families would have to deal with segregated schools, segregated housing. Look, right off base, uh, there's gonna be redlining, okay, not officially, but before, uh, really, 1971, African Americans and their families would have to move far from uh, their, their place of work, often because they won't rent to them. We still have segregated schools uh, into the 60s. Brown, Brown v. Board is 1954, okay? And so again, uh, off post, African American families are still having to deal with these challenges, and their wives are taking the brunt of it, often. Uh, the other thing, too, we see Let's talk about PCSing for a moment. Now, and each, well, let's say PCSing. We'll see that when African Americans would have to travel from one military base to another, they couldn't always stop in motels uh, that everybody else could, that white Americans could. We would see that there'd be green books uh, that African American officers and their families would often be given that would tell them of certain motels that would take them and their families, okay? And I wanna read a vignette to you. Uh, I interviewed uh, Dr. Butler's wife, Joe Butler, and they had just come back from a three-year tour in Germany. And as they're leaving Fort Bragg, North Carolina, uh, they have to cut through the South on their way uh, to Dallas. And when they stop in a little town, think of a town such as Mayberry, okay? Mayberry, USA, a nice little town. There's a gas station in the middle of, uh, in the center of the little town where you're going to get some gas. And I quote, the guy, when I say the guy, think of someone looking like Gomer Pyle. The guy came out and was going to fill up the car. He put the hose in the gas tank, and DR asked him about the restroom, and he, the fill station attendant, 
had on this cap. And he must have turned his cap four different ways. So think of this guy when this young black woman says, you know, where are the restrooms? He stands there, her husband asks, and he turns the hat left, right, he scratches his head, and then a deep southern drawl, he says, Shaw ain't. In other words, Shaw ain't no bathroom for you and your family to use. And look, these are, these are people serving the country, okay, in uniform. So immediately, Butler says, take the hose out of the car. They get in the car, and they proceed to drive down the road, hoping to find a place where they can have some type of amenities where they can leave themselves and fill the car up with gas. One more uh, story I'd like to share. Uh, another one of my officers uh, is leaving Fort Bliss, Texas, El Paso, and he has to drive the Fort Ord, which is right around 1,200 miles. He drives straight through 1,200 miles uh, right around 1964 because no one will put him and his wife up in a motel for the night. And folks, we're talking a 1962 car, not a 2014 car that's comfortable, okay? So I'm saying that these are some of the things that African Americans uh, had to deal with. And think of this every two or three years when you have to PCS. So uh, again, it's an incredible amount of uh, racism and uh, endurance that these families had to, had to go through. Okay, next slide. And this ties into one of the other key elements that would hurt the ascension of black officers is going to be the value of social networks. Now, and this is going to tie into what I call survival taxes. Now listen, look, since 80% or nearly 80% of African-American officers come from HBCUs, they're not going to be able to develop the type of connections that white officers can. They don't have the luxury of history of where their grandfather, their uncle, uh, their brother had served and has time who could actually pave the way for them. Quite frankly, things like mentors, godfathers. So again, a lot of the white officers, they would have this. African Americans don't. They don't have the Westport connection. A few do. A few do. But we see that culturally, African Americans are not getting the penetration they need to get into these levels to have these mentors. Okay? Now, one of the most noted groups uh, that's still around today are going to be, obviously, the Rocks. Uh, created by uh, Rock Cartwright and um, Colonel uh, Bobby Burke. Now, prior to the Rocks getting together, uh, we'll see that, particularly in the Washington, D.C. area, where Cartwright and Bobby were, Burke were, that there would be this outreach to young black officers, new officers in the area. They would invite them over for informal meetings, and they would tell them about, okay, this is a way that you can uh, help your career. This is an officer, a white officer, that you can work with that's, that's more liberal, okay? This is the job that you need to take to actually get promoted. So I'm saying that mentoring takes place spontaneously uh, when these officers begin to get together. And these are what, what I call survival tactics. These young officers are groomed, and the wise will talk with the other wise about what schools they can go to, what churches they can go to, places uh, socially they can go to that, uh, again, we see that uh, white officers and their families don't have to contend with, all right? Now, initially, when the Rocks get together, uh, the Army has a problem with this because they think they're going to be a political group. We see these are high-ranking officers. Uh, there was an argument that, hey, this is not, was not a political group. It's a social group. And again, it's still with us today. It's over 1,000 strong. But again, these are going to be some of the connections that we see. Now, what happens from here, that a group, a generation of black officers will, will have a great scope of awareness of how the army begins, how the army works. And when they PCS to different parts of the country, we'll see that they, many, not all, will begin to do the same thing of mentoring other black officers to help them understand uh, what they need to do uh, to have successful careers. Okay. Next slide. Okay, I want to talk a moment about combat arms versus combat support. And there's, there's a, lot of, uh, a lot of talk about this today. And so uh, we can trace this largely from the Vietnam era, probably up to this last conflict that we're ending. But we'll see that today, uh, roughly one in five uh, black officers uh, serves in a combat arms job. Things like armor, infantry, artillery. And we see that rather than choosing combat arms, black officers have historically tended to gravitate 
towards uh, fields such as administrative jobs, engineering, supply, maintenance, these types of professions that will translate more easily into civilian work. And again, there, there's really no coincidence behind this because we see that in these combat arms jobs, a lot of times they tend to be a little more subjective. Now, just stay with me. Now, anytime you have a job like engineering, cyber, logistics, these types of jobs are based on uh, knowing a special type of information. Look, you either know it or you don't know it. You know it, you're getting promoted. You don't know it, well, you probably won't be promoted. Uh, so we see that this would take out one of the pieces of subjectivity. And we'll see that this has led to the modern trend of black officers in many cases being promoted sl at slower rates because they are in support occupation and not tip of the spear combat operation, operational jobs that, that promote faster. Moreover, since blacks are less likely to be promoted uh, at a faster level, we see that they tend to leave the service earlier based on frustration with the system and the institutions up and out uh, protocols for when it's time for you to leave the service. So again, these are one of the things that we see. Now let me, let me go on and say this. If you look at the elite of elite in the military, particularly I'll, I'll say the Army, when we look at uh, the 82nd, the Rangers, SOP, Special Forces, the more elite, the wider it tends to be. Okay, I mean these are just things that you see. Now we, there, there's always going to be uh, the exceptions, and with this, look, we see General Lloyd Austin III, commander, commander at CENTCOM. Okay, he was a deputy chief. Uh, he was in the 82nd. We see uh, Roscoe Robinson, also in the 82nd. Greg Beckton, commander of 7th Corps, and Andy Chambers. Uh, again, another three-star, commands the 1st Cav, and uh, during from 82 to 84. So again, there's always the exception, but for the most part, these are some of the problems that we see that black officers have to deal with. Okay, next slide. Concerning military service, we see that the vast majority of African-American officers from the Vietnam era believed their contribution to the advancement of the race came from working on the inside of the system by affecting policy and maintaining high standards. It would have been counterproductive for black officers to meet staunch racists on their own ground. For this generation of officers, it would be more productive to evolutionize than revolutionize based on non-productive attacks on the system. Major General Robert C. Gaskill, Howard University class of 1952, and the first African-American deputy command co commandant of U.S. Military War College stated that he and other black officers overwhelmed their critics with professional competence. The act of fighting inequities and injustices with competence and professionalism practiced by the vast majority of black officers helped to alter many racist preconceived notions that officers of color could not measure up to their white contemporaries. In closing, by examining black officers' contributions, humility, and professionalism, and the challenges that these men and women overcame in the area of race during a time of war, this shows us individuals with astonishing character. The journey of the African-American officer through the Vietnam era was a complex one. Their actions serve as an example of African-Americans' commitment and sense of duty in the face of inequality and racism. Thank you for coming today. Okay. And I will now have a question and answer session uh, from the group. There's one in the back there. Oh, well, there's a couple. Oh, that was right. right there. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, uh, for the research, for the sources I was able to get, it was primarily Army centric. However, when we look at the Marine Corps and the Navy, uh, and remember, they're the most African Americans going to be in the Army. Uh, particularly when we talk about the Butler study, this is going to be kind of a benchmark of if it's this way in the Army, it has to be probably the same or worse in the other branches. So again, the, it was basically Army-centric.
Yeah, uh, off the top, ma'am, I, I, I'm not sure for my, co for my scope of research, but I will say that after 1972, when we see the creation of DRI, the, the Defense Race Relations Institute, this is when the military begins to use education uh, to combat uh, all these isms that are tearing the service apart uh, during the Vietnam era. Let me ask you that. In fact, uh, the military services do have uh, groups like ROCKS. Air Force has AFCOMAP. The Navy has, I think it's called in 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 NOA, right? In NOA. Uh, so, yeah, they are uh, like groups in other services. Any indications on how the Army's doing right now? For the officers that I, I still talk to, uh, there's still issues in the sense that uh, they're not getting some of the, what I want to say, some of the career moving jobs. I mean, over and over, after I sit and talk with many of them, they'll say, hey, you never see them as, okay, not never, you rarely see them as part of the G3 or the S3. So there's still some frustration uh, with the system. Now, obviously, we're doing better. We have more general officers now than ever. We have more uh, African-American field grade officers than ever. But you kind of have to go inside the numbers to see what types of jobs they have, the time of promotion that it takes them to reach these jobs, uh, and again, their overall ascension, ascension of, of what's happening with their careers. Okay. Let, 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 me come, let me come in on that as well. I would tell you that uh, this diversity uh, uh, thing is really a journey, and the Department of Defense continues on that journey. But I'm happy to report that all military services, in fact, have a, at least one four-star general. In fact, uh, you may, be, may not know that recently uh, the first black female four-star, Admiral Michelle Howard, was named. So uh, we're moving forward. One of, the, one of the relevant things that Dr. Hampton pointed out persists, though, and that is the matter of combat on versus combat support. Uh, you know, we continue to access uh, bl black officers at about 7 percent of the, of the college graduate market. That's about the number, 7, 8 uh, percent. So we get our share, but it still is a persistence that black officers still tend not to select combat arms. So we're trying to work some strategies to, to get more folks mentored, uh, uh, talking to them in, when in ROTC and preparing them for those uh, uh, combat arm positions. Because combat arms, those are the positions that currently rise to the top. It's not just in the Army. It exists also in the military, all other services as well. First and foremost, I just want to thank you for your study and presenting it in a manner that we could actually digest, understand, and move forward with. It's not to send us back, but to how do we take this information and move forward. So my question stems from being a woman in the military, having lived through a lot of this. Did you interview any women as part of this study? Because I would have liked to have had that husband's book handed to my husband <laughs> to move forward. You know, um, we talk about it, but you know, that's still the missing link. And I would like to see how we fare in the numbers as we move forward. Yeah, and, and thank you. Thank you very much. That's a great question. Uh, for this scope of, of research, uh, particularly since it's the Vietnam era, I, I mainly focused on uh, the males. Now, that being said, we know this is during the time of the WAC Corps. WAC started until 1977, which was probably before you were born, right? So uh, while we see that the, where the combat arms are, which again is where most of the action is, uh, a, a comparison between the WAC Corps and again these, these primary types of jobs, uh, really this is not part of the scope, but uh, I agree with you. I think a study like that maybe should be done. Let, let me come in on that as well. And I challenge Dr. Hampton to in fact uh, do some research because in fact, <laughs> as you look at the, at the officer corps uh, from a race ethnicity standpoint, gender standpoint, the growth is in females. I mean, in fact, uh, women are, are taking over, if you will. That's a good thing. Uh, <laughs> they are growing leaps and bounds. In fact, Latinas are, is the biggest uh, group uh, that's growing over the last decade. But amongst officers, uh, women, all races, uh, women are much more in, in presence than they were a decade ago. Yes, sir. Earlier you talked about your book a little bit. I just would like to know just a little bit more about your book as well as what particular chapter in your book that you decided that you liked a little more than the rest. Okay, yeah, thank you, that's, that's a great question. Now while the book is, is, is titled uh, The Black Officer Corps, I spend uh, a chapter uh, looking at the enlisted. Look, I'm an old, not old, fairly young enlisted guy still. I'm not still, but I was. 
So I think one of the most enjoyable chapters was uh, interviewing uh, the, some of the enlisted guys in writing about some of their experiences uh, in the sense that most of them didn't trust their officers. Okay, a lot of them were black enlisted. They, they would throw the black power salute and they really thought that a lot of the black officers had been co-opted by the system. So again, there's a, there, there was a level of trust and in leadership, what's the biggest thing that you need from your soldiers, or airmen, seamen? Yeah, you gotta have trust, okay? And with this, this is part of one of the, the main tenets that begins to tear, tear uh, the military apart. Uh, as far as sources for writing the book, when I went to the National Archives, uh, a gentleman I spoke with, a great guy, great archivist by the name of Rich Bolin, um, I, and I'd written him uh, months before this telling him what I was looking for, things on racial tension, things on unfair promotion. When I got there, I told him again, I was ready to kind of get, dive into my work, and he said, Isaac, he said, what you're looking for, the military isn't going to have. They're too embarrassed to keep records on it. And so, again, what I had to do was really look at private collections, look at things like newspaper articles, uh, other things that contextualized that part of history outside from the official history, because uh, if the military has those types of studies beyond what I was able to get uh, from, from Dr. Butler, um, I wouldn't have been able to complete uh, the research. Good question. Some, some clip? Okay. <laughs> Okay, let's first, uh, let's give Dr. Dr. Hampton another round of applause. Thank you, sir. And th thanks to the OSD Historical Office. On their behalf, I just presented uh, Dr. Hampton with a coin. So again, uh, Doc, thank you very much. All right. Thank you. And let, let us close. Again, thank you all for being here today. Uh, I want to make sure that if you want to follow what our office is doing, uh, diversity.defense.gov, check us out. Facebook, Twitter, you know, sign on and let us know what's going on, figure out what we're doing. Also, uh, in closing, I want to say, let's keep in mind uh, the 1.4 million active duty men and women, the 1.1 million reserve component members, the 700 and so thousand civilians every day. They are out there protecting our freedoms. They are out there keeping our way of life. So thank you so much for participating today's session. Thank you for joining us. Have a good day and a good week.